Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and a while back I did a video on making memorable NPCs. And in it I said I was going to come back and expand in the area of major non-player characters. So that's what we're going to do today. Specifically, today we're going to discuss NPC companions, uh, which are non-player characters that go on adventures or travel with the player characters, uh, versus NPCs that the characters might interact with and then leave to go on the adventure. So we're going to go over some tips on how to do them, why to use them, as well as some things to look out for and avoid. I do want to go ahead and apologize though, because there are so many points that I want to make when I started writing this all out, and uh, normally I try to do it in some sort of, you know, kind of order that flows and makes a lot of sense. Uh, I wasn't able to do it with this one, so uh, this topic we're going to be kind of bouncing all over the place. Companions can come in a lot of different forms and relations to the player characters. Uh, maybe they're underlings, like hirelings, squires, or apprentices. Maybe they're full-on party members, and from the player character's view, or even an audience's view, they're just one of the gang like everyone else. Or they can be the patron, mentor, or boss of the player character. In the previous video I talked about how NPCs should have their own personalities, motivations, and quirks, and everything that makes them great characters, and that is all still true. So no matter what role the NPC companion has in relation to the player characters, they still need to have these fundamental things about them. Now what he's trying to say here, and not doing a good job of explaining, is that many of the gripes that players have about NPC companions and why they fail is rooted in game masters forgetting the basics of what what makes an NPC great to begin with, most often their limitations. Companions can serve a lot of purposes, and one of the big ones is helping teach players the basics. Back when I started playing D&D in middle school, our game master, who was one of our dads and one of the funniest men that I've ever known, he brought an NPC companion into our first adventure, and he was a dwarf cook named Pinfold. Just like from the old Danger Mouse cartoon, he did a great impersonation of him that I can't even begin to give justice to. Whoa, hey, Chief! Anyway, Pinfold would hang out kind of in the back of the party. Uh, he had a frying pan that he would use in combat if things got really hairy. He was a great character. Now, Pinfold served several purposes. One was role play. You know, we were all dungeon crawlers at the time, which uh, dungeons really aren't the best place to kind of interact with NPCs that aren't busy trying to eat your face off. Uh, so we got to interact with Pinfold, and uh, their game master got to demonstrate what it was like to role play, and we got to practice our role playing back and forth with Pinfold. Pinfold. Next, Pinfold could show us not just the basics of what a first level character should know, because we as players didn't know all that stuff yet, but he could also give us information about the world. You know, stuff the Game Master would normally tell us, but now he could tell us that information through the voice of Pinfold. Stuff like that there's a swamp to the west of us. That's information that our characters would know, but instead of our Game Master just saying, there's a swamp to the west of you, he would say, Quah, now there's a big old swamp to the west of us, sir. Lost my best spatula last time. I was there. Dark things live in that swamp, Chief. Dark things indeed. Pinfold might also point out some of the obvious things from time to time that we as player characters should know, but we didn't know as players yet. Uh, things like setting up a watch around camp at night. Or he might have some sort of mundane supply on him that we forgot to put on our character sheet. Uh, things like a uh, rope or torches or that sort of thing. Uh, he might have a single healing potion on him if we really needed it, but he would only have one of them, and he'd only have it once, and we had to pay him back. When I started running Call of Cthulhu, which is a game about investigation, all of my players had 15 years or more experience based in games where there was mostly combat and no investigation. I brought an NPC to help kind of teach my players the ropes. Yeah, I was wondering when you were going to bring me up. Hey, I'm Jack the NPC. You might recognize me as the star of this channel, but my real origin story is far more humble. When I first ran The Haunting, a scenario designed to introduce new players to Call of Cthulhu, and it's where the player characters get a job about a haunted house. It tells them what their options are and suggests researching the house before they go inside of it. But instead of just outright telling my players that those were what their options are, I brought in an NPC named Jack. Now, Jack was a detective, and he specialized in paranormal investigation. Jack was also a bit of a drunk and a loser. So Jack was the one who was initially offered the job from the employer, but then 
he picks up the PCs to kind of show them the ropes and kind of teach them the business. So instead of just having him tell them what their options are, uh, I had Jack tell them what the job was, and then ask them what they wanted to do. Now, of course, my players went with their first impulse, and they said that they should just go check out the haunted house, because they didn't think that there was any other option than just going straight to the haunted house. Yeah, we could do that, but I don't want to go strolling in there without knowing what I'm strolling into first. Maybe we could check around and dig up some information on the place, that way we're better prepared. Then, through role-playing it out with Jack, the players came up all on their own what their different options were as far as researching the haunted house, and all the information that the module was initially just going to hand them, they went ahead and role-played out, and they got to kind of discover all this for themselves. So my using Jack allowed me to give them that information in a way that was engaging, and made the players start thinking like investigators should. And that's far more effective and fun than just simply handing them what their options are. Now, during the adventure itself, Jack was mostly observing his students, you know, letting them take charge, because that's what good teachers should do. And also because he was kind of hungover, and that's what hungover teachers always do. Now, with mentor and PC companions, the big thing that game masters need to remember is to first not steal the spotlight. The players are the stars, and while these NPCs can be sources of information, they should never be used as helplines that have all the answers, uh, more on that one in a bit. I usually make these characters not the best combatants. That way, once combat starts, the NPC usually kind of falls back into the back and lets the players kind of take the show for themselves. But the big thing that you need to learn with mentors is learning when they need to go away. These type of mentor companions are invaluable to players who are either new to the game or new to this particular system, but like with training wheels, they should only be temporary. Otherwise, they can become a crutch or begin holding the player characters back. Obi-Wan Kenobi, who shows up long enough to give Luke his mission, an afternoon in Jedi school, and then show him the ropes a bit, he then dies, becoming a ghost who conveniently comes back from time to time to drop some information on Luke. For both Pinfold and Jack, they eventually wandered off somewhere around the third adventure. Sure. They had their own stuff that they needed to go do, and they might come back from time to time with an adventure hook, or maybe accompany them on some other adventure if they felt like it, but essentially, their job as a mentor and companion was done. Now let's talk about underlings. As I said, the companion might be in a servile position, like a squire or cook, or henchman under the player character's employ or mentorship. Now these could be low-level helpers like pack carriers, or highly competent professionals that are tasked with a specific job. In Traveler, for example, the heroes probably own a spaceship, and they fly around the galaxy having all sorts of space adventures. Now, a spaceship has a lot of positions that need filling, and your group might not be big enough to cover all those positions. Or maybe your group is big enough, but nobody wanted to fill one of those specific roles, so now you got an opening for one. So you can just simply hire somebody to fill that role. Uh, so let's say you hire a pilot, or a mechanic, who basically just stays on the ship while the real PCs go out and do PC things. These are extremely competent NPC companions, but their skills are very focused on one specific aspect that the player characters need. Now, they could serve other roles as well, sure, but if they do, their pay might have to change. So let's discuss rewarding NPC companions. Do hirelings get a cut of the loot? Well, that depends. If they were brought in for one specific job, and they only performed that one task that they were hired to do, then probably not. But if they've worked their way on up to full-on party members, then maybe? It really depends on the NPC's personality at that point. If the player characters hired them for one thing, and now the NPC is doing all sorts of other things for the party, the NPC might demand that they get a raise, or a share of the profits, uh, so really it comes down to what would that character want. What about XPs? If you're playing a game like Dungeons & Dragons, or experience points are a thing, and the player characters kill that monster that's worth 8,000 experience points, does the NPC companion get a share? Uh, that's a case where it's completely up to the game master to decide. For me, it depends on what role the non-player character played in the on how they got those experience points. Uh, if they were active participants who helped turn the tide, either by a fighting or healing or some other critical role like that, uh, then they're probably going to get some cut of the experience points for it. 
After all, if the player characters couldn't have succeeded without the NPC's help, the NPC deserves a partial, if not equal, share. Now, Some game masters do not agree with that philosophy, uh, feeling that it takes away from the player characters if they have to share those sweet, sweet experience points with lowly NPCs. But I see it that if the player characters could not have completed the adventure, uh, meaning getting any of the treasure or experience points that they got without the help of the NPC companion, then the player characters don't deserve the full experience points that that monster or whatever is worth because they didn't fully earn it on their own. Now, I'm also the type of game master that if the player characters bring along some hirelings or henchmen or something like that, uh, that they are going to have some sort of active role in combat, then the number of bad guys that they face once they get to wherever they're going might go up a little bit, or the power level of the bad guy might go up a little bit as a way to compensate and keep the player characters challenged. So that will help them to get some minions to help them out, but at the same time, it's not going to make it completely easy for them. Also, NPCs should be improving as the adventures uh, go on and they're journeying with the player characters. Uh, if the improvements to characters are done through experience points, then the NPC should be getting some sort of experience points for accompanying the player characters. Uh, maybe not a full share, because they're not going to be doing everything that the player characters do, at least most likely they won't, but they need to have some amount of reward to reflect how involved they were. That way, as the campaign goes on, those uh, henchmen or hirelings or whatever are becoming more and more powerful as the player characters are becoming more and more powerful as well. Now, one question that a lot of game masters ask with henchmen and hirelings is who makes their roles? Uh, the players who hired them, or does the game master make the roles for them? And once again, that's really up to the game master to decide. But for me, as a game master, I handle all of their role play, their dialogue, and their personality, and all of that stuff that makes them a character. But the player usually handles all the dice rolling, and very often they'll handle the hit points and inventory, and basically the paperwork aspect of it. But that is all case by case, so you'll have to decide for yourself, depending on the dynamic of the group and who the players are. But I do find it just a lot easier if the player who's the boss of the NPC just goes ahead and handles all the paperwork for them. But the big thing to remember is that NPC companions, even if they are underlings, are still characters. They should still have their own motivations, their own flaws, and everything else. Even lowly hirings, if they're abused, won't put up with it. Remember that scene in The Mummy where the guys are about to open up that vault and that one guy is all like, Hold on, this is probably trapped. Let the peons do it. Then the hirelings get their faces melted off. If the player characters treat their hirelings like fodder, then those hirelings might leave in the middle of the night and maybe steal some of the player characters' stuff while they're going. Or maybe once they get back to town or civilization and uh, they tell everybody about it, now no one is going to be willing to travel with the player characters because they know it's just a death sentence. Or maybe the PCs will find somebody that'll travel with them, but for kind of a uh, improved disaster pay. Up front, paid to their family before they go. Ah, speaking of abuse, let's talk about helpline abuse. I said that an NPC companion can be really helpful for passing some hints and information to the players. However, players might try to take advantage of this. The cavern before you splits into three passages, each of them stretching downward into darkness. Damn, I don't know which one of these we should take. Me neither, and I don't want to choose the wrong one. Don't worry, dude, I've got an idea. I'm going to ask Herb, the helpful footman, which way he suggests that we should go. That is brilliant. Seth would never tell us to go the way that leads to misfortune. Otherwise, we could accuse him of trying to sabotage the game. Exactly. Some players try to avoid making a decision by basically shirking that off onto a non-player character, and therefore the game master to make the call as far as what the PCs should do. It's a cheap coward's move that's usually employed by people who think that they're being clever when really it's just obvious what they're trying to do. So, in those situations, game masters keep in mind that the non-player character is always limited by what that character should know, their own flaws, their own intelligence, their own priorities, and their own motivations. They might be in competent or biased or just be giving out some bad advice. In fact, uh, the NPC companions should normally have a little bit of incompetence, bias, and giving out bad advice. Uh, that way they're not considered to be absolutely reliable all the time, and the players still have to think about anything that the NPC tells them and not just take that as solid gold. So in cases like that with the three passages, a uh, game master could have their NPC say, Well, sir, I'm the third of eight children, so I say we go with the third one. Which is essentially telling the players that the NPC's decision is based off some sketchy reasoning. Or you could just do it like this. Herb rubs his chin. Hmm, now let me think about this. 
I say you go with a second one, sir. Yeah, I'm questioning the validity of his choice. Now, just to be clear, there is nothing wrong with the player characters asking for the NPC companion's input. Uh, that's perfectly fine, I even encourage it. But the problem becomes a problem of intent as far as what they're wanting to get out of it and why they're doing it. Uh, if the player characters are asking the companion's input because they consider the companion to be a member of the party, then great. If they want to roleplay out this conversation with the NPC as a way of verbalizing their own ideas, is, uh, essentially using the NPC as a sounding board as they think, then that's also perfectly fine. The problem becomes if they're trying to dodge responsibility of committing to an answer themselves by just having the Game Master do it for them. So it becomes the Game Master's responsibility to learn how to spot the difference between the two, and also make it clear that the NPC hardly has all of the answers and shouldn't be considered right 100% of the time. Now this leads us to the next thing our NPC companion can do. They can be your wild card. Hard. Have you ever had your players be so careful, play smart, and roll so well that you want to inject a bit of action or excitement into the game uh, because they're having so easy of a time with it that at the end of the night they might not as be satisfied with the game because it was just so easy for them? Then the wild card is your answer. Remember that time in Return of the Jedi when the heroes found that trap and they were all like, yeah, this is totally a trap, and then Chewie was all like, I'm gonna touch it, and then boom, the plot moved forward, wild card. Chewie, who is clearly an NPC, that's why he didn't get a medal at the end of the first movie. He did what Hungry Wookiees do, and he sprang the trap. Or remember that time in Return of the Jedi when the player characters were dragging their feet, trying to figure out a way to get inside the shield generator, so when Ewok was all like, screw this, I'm gonna get the action started by yoinking their speeder. Wild card. Now that example was clearly to the player character's advantage. It got rid of several of the stormtroopers and allowed them to get into the shield generator a lot easier. But that was a lot more exciting than just spending the next two hours of the game session having everybody like sit around and debate their plans and not actually playing the game. So companions can be fantastic tools to help you as a game master inject a bit of drama in the situation and get the game moving forward. In my recent review that I did for the Call of Cthulhu scenario, The Secret of Castor Negro, I pointed out out that having the bad guys kidnap the NPC companion can inject some urgency into the adventure. You can even kill an NPC companion as a way of heightening the stakes. Remember that the player characters are the stars of the show, so having a big threat just come in and take out one of the NPCs really ups the tension and tells the players that things just got real. So if you've had a companion that's kind of been around for a while, and the players might just kind of assume that this NPC is going to be around for the course of the entire campaign, uh, maybe they believe there's a little bit of plot armor involved or something like that, having that companion die can be extremely shocking. Or they and make fantastic emergency backup characters. Say your players are on an adventure and one of the PCs gets killed or incapacitated. Now normally this is when you would have them bring in a second character or a new character to play, but just due to the situation of the game and wherever the player characters are, it really isn't plausible to bring a new character in because there's nowhere you could bring them in from. So in cases like that, I'll just hand the player the character sheet for the NPC companion and let them play the NPC as if they were a PC until we can get to a spot where we can kind of bring in their new character and then they hand me back the NPC, providing that they're still alive at that point and the game can keep moving forward. And that's a lot more fun for the player to do than just kind of sitting around and watching everybody else play. In cases where the NPC companion is the employer, mentor, or patron, the big hurdle is not letting the NPC steal the spotlight from the player characters. Maybe the patron is extremely weak in combat and that's why the player characters are with them. Or maybe they're just grooming the PCs to sort of take their place one day. Just be sure that this NPC leader isn't going to be used as a way to sort of railroad the game or becomes a crutch where the NPC does all the heavy lifting while the players just kind of sit around in the back. Uh, so what you want to do is make a reason why the NPC can't be used this way, either as a railroad for you or as a crutch for them. That's a problem that's a lot easier to avoid in a skill-based game versus a level-based one, where uh, experience doesn't necessarily mean that you're far more powerful than the lesser experienced characters. Uh, so in skill-based games, it's a lot easier to do an NPC sort of mentor or boss that isn't just exponentially more powerful than the PCs that are supposed to be the stars. Finally, let's look at GMPCs, or DMPCs for you D&D players out there. These are times when the Game Master tries to play the game just like they were a normal player. 
Now this is a problem that you most often see in new game masters, ones who want to play the game but they're stuck running it because nobody else is willing to run the game, so they convince themselves that they can somehow play as well. The truth is, is that a game master is never going to have the same experience as a person that's just normally playing the game. Uh, the game master knows what's behind the door, they already know the answer to the riddle, uh, so they're not going to get the same excitement as everybody else because they don't need to figure out all that information, they already know it. Their hard part is keeping a poker face because they know the answers and the players don't. GMPCs just feel insincere. The players can tell when a game master is doing that. You are not fooling anybody into them thinking that they don't know what you're trying to do here. What's worse is that game masters run the very probable risk of robbing the spotlight from the players. Remember, the players are the stars, the game master is not. So the player characters are the ones that should be solving the puzzle or landing that killing blow and be the badasses that walk away with all the stories of being awesome badasses. And GMPCs steal from that. Also, since the game master is the one that's controlling everything from behind the curtain, they run the serious risk of having their own character, if they're trying to play one, ruin their own impartiality, or maybe that character starts getting plot armor, all of which is, once again, taking away from the players. Now, Game Masters, you can still have a lot of fun playing the game with some very elaborate and very active non-player characters, uh, but the line between NPC and PC should never blur in your mind. NPCs should always be supporting cast. Game Masters should always be wary of accidentally giving the NPC companion uh, too much of the spotlight or too much of the role, because they could accidentally turn this NPC into a GMPC without realizing that they're doing it until it's too late. Or, which is just as bad, you could end up getting accused of that from your players. And if your players believe that's what you're doing, even if that's not what you intended to do, the results are still the same for them. You've diminished their experience. The simple answer is, is that you can never pretend that you're just a regular player like everybody else. You just can't do it. The players should always be the big stars of your show. Your job is to support them, never upstage them. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews and how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, players, you have a great day. You know, I think a cool idea would be to have your campaign that's got your mentor NPCs like normal, but then, once that campaign ends, the player characters from the first campaign become the mentor NPCs to the next campaign. And then, once that second campaign ends, the player characters from the second campaign become the mentor NPCs to the player characters for the third campaign. That sounds like that would be a brilliant plan. I also think I just described the Star Wars formula.